Hello friends, here is your latest new and improved replay from the cache. This is a story I fell in love with 5,000 years ago when I was an undergrad, and it was on the list of things to cover on the podcast from the beginning. I'm so excited to share it with you again. This one originally aired two years ago. I've fiddled with the sound and hopefully made it a better listening experience for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the rediscovery of one of the most interesting animals ever to grace our incredible oceans. The ancient, curious, fantastic, long-lost coelacanth. I hope you enjoy. It's striking how little we know about the oceans on our own planet. According to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, over 90% of our oceans still remain unmapped by modern sonar technology. The oceans cover around 70% of the planet's surface. They regulate weather, temperature, provide us with food, and in one way or another, affect and support all life on planet Earth. When we think of exploration these days, we tend to look up and imagine what else is out there, spinning around in space, well past the familiar stars of our own Milky Way. But the truth is, we barely know what's beneath us. And when we look down, way down, deep past the shallow waters we so often take for granted, there are entire worlds, ecosystems, forms of life we aren't even close to discovering, just waiting there in the vast darkness left unexplored. And sometimes the unknown doesn't wait for us to find it. Sometimes it finds us first. And that's exactly what happened on December 22, 1938, when Captain Hendrik Goosen was trawling for fish off the coast of South Africa near the mouth of the Chalumna River, where it empties out into the Indian Ocean. When he pulled up his net, there was something strange caught amongst the more typical species he was so used to seeing. It was so unusual that he went out of his way to call the East London Museum in South Africa. They had requested that anyone who caught something out of the ordinary contact them as they wanted to collect specimens and learn as much as possible about the different species living in South Africa's waters. He made the call. And museum curator Marjorie Courtney Latimer made her way out to the docks. What she found there would become one of the most important biological discoveries of the century. Today, let's explore the discovery of a living fossil. This is the story of Marjorie Courtney Latimer and the rebirth of the coelacanth. I'm your host, Kristen Robine Terpstra, and this is the History Cache. Let's have a look inside. Sixty-six million years ago, something extraordinary happened. The Chicxulub asteroid, some say comet, tore through Earth's atmosphere. It was six to nine miles, or ten to fifteen kilometers across, and left a gigantic impact crater around 93 miles, or 150 kilometers in diameter. According to the BBC, it hit with a force equivalent to billions of nuclear bombs. It killed upwards of 75% of all life on planet Earth. So that was bad news for most life forms. The mass extinction triggered by the Chicxulub impact changed which life forms thrived on Earth. Nothing over 55 pounds or 25 kilos on land even had a chance. A few small avian dinosaurs made it through. Their ancestors are probably singing outside your window right now. If this impact hadn't occurred, life on Earth would probably look much different today. There are plenty of theories on this if you have a couple hours to kill. Fun side note, we'll probably be hit by another asteroid or comet again at some point. 
according to a study published in Scientific Reports by A.V. Loeb and Frank Baird of Harvard University. They believe, based on statistical analysis and gravitational simulations, that comets hanging out at the edge of our solar system are sometimes bumped off course by Jupiter's gravitational field, which then sends them closer to the Sun. After that, they become what's called a sun grazer and orbit the sun for a couple hundred years until tidal force breaks them apart. On their way out, these smaller comets have a statistical chance of hitting Earth. Apparently, this happens every 250 to 730 million years or so. It's possible that the Chicxulub impact was caused by one of these comets, pinballed from Jupiter, then picked up by the sun, broken, and hurled towards our planet. For a long time, we thought that coelacanths, a group of fish comprising around 90 different species, had ended their 400 million year old swim with the extinction of the dinosaurs. That was until Marjorie Courtney Latimer found one in a pile of fish on a dock in South Africa. Marjorie was born February 24th, 1907, she was the daughter of a railroad accountant who moved her family around to different stations throughout South Africa. From a young age, she had an intrinsic interest in the natural world. She would collect birds' eggs and insects, birds especially. By age 11, she swore she would one day become an expert on birds. Her interest in fossils began when she saw the fossil fish collection that belonged to one of the nuns at a convent school she was attending. Marjorie wanted to work at a museum, but opportunities for women in the sciences were extremely limited in the early 20th century. So she planned on studying nursing instead. However, when the East London Museum had an opening for a curator, she applied. Her knowledge on the biodiversity of South Africa was impressive, as she had been exploring and collecting it since childhood. She was offered the position, and she excitedly accepted. She was 24 years old at the time. It was the start of a 42-year career that would greatly impact the world of science. According to The Guardian, when she began her position at the museum, all their collection consisted of were six dead birds, a six-legged piglet in a jar, a few pictures of East London, and some prints of the Kosa Wars. Marjorie wouldn't only expand that collection, she would make history doing so. The day Captain Goosen called about his strange catch, the now 31-year-old Marjorie was busy putting together a fossil reptile display. The ever-curious Marjorie put aside the fossils and took a cab down to meet the captain. The first thing she noticed when she approached the pile of various fish in Captain Goosen's catch was an odd blue fin a lobed fin. What's weird about that is most lobed finned fishes are extinct. The only exception known in 1938 were lungfishes. Lungfish are able to breathe air, and in the case of the West African lungfish, for example, can use its lobed fins to crawl through mud and even across land, then burrow itself underground where it can remain in a state of estivation, a sort of summer version of hibernation, for months, or in some cases, up to six years. There are six known species of lungfish alive today. They've been around for going on 400 million years, much older than any dinosaur, and have changed very little. If you ever have a couple minutes, go to YouTube and check out lungfishes. They are creepy and beautiful at the same time. Lobed finned fishes are an important part of understanding how terrestrial land animals evolved. If Marjorie had ever seen a lobed fin before, it had probably been attached to a fossil millions of years old. She began picking away at the layer of slime covering the strange specimen before her. Underneath, she found the rest of the pale blue fish with faint flecks of white spots. It was iridescently silver, blue, and green, all at the same time. The colors played over the scales in a brilliant sheen. It was covered in hard scales and had four limb-like lobed fins, and what Marjorie described as a strange puppy dog tail. She said it was the most beautiful fish 
she had ever seen. And she had no idea what it was. But she knew it needed to be preserved. She now had to find a way to get this 5 foot long, 127 pound fish back to the museum. She hailed a cab and had quite a bit of difficulty talking the driver into putting this huge, slimy, dead fish into the trunk of their car. Eventually, her persuasiveness availed, and Marjorie and her fish made their way back to the museum. Once there, she excitedly approached the museum's chairman about her new specimen. He was not at all interested. He dismissed Marjorie, told her it was nothing more than a rock cod, and went on vacation. I tried finding a South African rock cod species that looks anything like the huge coelacanth Marjorie brought into the museum that day. Nothing I found resembles that fish by any considerable margin. There is a white blotched grouper that sort of looks like a coelacanth if your eyes are half closed, but the chairman specifically told Marjorie she had found nothing more than a rock cod. I don't know why he was so dismissive of her or this historic find. But if she had stopped her inquiry right there and let this chairman who was so cavalier about this incredible fish deter her from further investigation, it would have taken many more decades for science to realize that the coelacanth had not perished with the dinosaurs and the other 75% of life on Earth 66 million years ago, but had been silently swimming below the surface, just out of reach within a world that, to this day, we know so little about. Luckily for science, it had Marjorie Courtney Latimer, a woman who would not be dismissed. And she was about to make scientific history. Marjorie Courtney Latimer knew this fish was something special. She just didn't quite know how special just yet. She began navigating her way through reference books, trying to identify its species, but to no avail. This is because in 1938, the scientific community believed the coelacanth had been extinct for around 66 million years. Usually when something goes extinct, it stays extinct so there was no need to catalog it with other extant species listed in reference books. Finding nothing in any book, and knowing she would get no help from the museum's chair, Marjorie decided she'd better seek some outside perspective. She knew an ichthyologist, a person who studies fishes, named J. L. B. Smith. He was a professor at Rhodes University. From what I've read, this guy really loved fish, and if anyone could help Marjorie identify her new specimen, it was him. But he didn't answer the phone. He was away, probably also on holiday, since it was two days before Christmas. Realizing getting this fish identified was going to take longer than she'd hoped, Marjorie knew she had to find a way to preserve it. This fish was huge, too big for a normal freezer. So not knowing what else to do, Marjorie took it to a local cold storage company. They were even less excited about this fish than the cab driver had been, and turned Marjorie and her fish away. Still determined, she then went to the local hospital morgue the day before Christmas in hopes that they would help her store it until she could get it identified. It was another hard no. They told her there was no way she was storing a huge dead fish in the hospital morgue. There seemed to be no room at the inn for Marjorie and her fish on Christmas Eve. I genuinely admire the dedication Marjorie Courtney Latimer had for the scientific inquiry of this fish. Out of options, and with a 5-foot, 127-pound decomposing fish on her hands, Marjorie finally found a part-time taxidermist who agreed to preserve it. This was not ideal, because this meant the specimen would be preserved, but without its internal organs. But it was better than nothing. Unable to reach ichthyologist J.L.B. Smith by phone, Marjorie sat down and sketched out the fish on a piece of paper and mailed it to him, along with a detailed description. When J.L.B. received Marjorie's sketch, he was shocked to his core. He said it was like a bomb had burst in his brain. 
It would be like sending an ornithologist whose life was nothing but birds a picture of a pterodactyl that you'd found flying around in your backyard. JLB knew he was looking at a coelacanth, and he told Marjorie what it was she had and how important it was, saying, quote, This discovery will be on the lips of every scientist in the world. And it pretty much was. This fish would make Marjorie sort of famous. JLB traveled to the East London Museum to see the coelacanth for himself. He said thinking about it had caused him, quote, much worry and sleepless nights. The feeling that JLB must have had when he approached the coelacanth for the first time must have been the closest thing any of us will ever experience to arriving in Jurassic Park. What a moment that must have been. He said of it later, quote, Although I had come prepared, that first sight hit me like a white-hot blast and made me feel shaky and queer. My body tingled. I stood stricken to stone. Yes, there was not a shadow of a doubt. Scale by scale, bone by bone, fin by fin, it was a true coelacanth." Unquote. The species of coelacanth that Marjorie discovered was named Latimeri Chalumne in honor of her. I wondered about Captain Henry Goosen, the captain who called Marjorie about the strange fish in his net a lot as I was researching this, because he's not as credited with the find as Marjorie is. But I suppose that's because the captain was going to just throw the coelacanth away. If Marjorie hadn't requested calls about the odd fish, or gone down to the docks that day, or been determined to preserve the first extant coelacanth known to science, then it would have taken at least decades more for this species to be discovered. Although coelacanths had only been known as fossils to science at the time, apparently the islanders living in the Comoros Islands were used to seeing coelacanths from time to time, and even, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, considered them edible if they were dried and salted. As soon as it was confirmed Marjorie had a coelacanth, the hunt began for another one, one that still had its internal organs. But science had to wait all the way until 1952 for another coelacanth. That was a 14-year stretch between finds. LBJ flew to the Comoros Islands, where the second one was found, in order to inspect it. And when he saw the five-foot-long fish still remarkably intact, he actually wept with joy. I told you this guy really loved fish. Over the years, almost 200 coelacanths have been caught. Many of them have been studied, and they are a fascinating species. I'm going to get just a little bit sciencey for a minute, because these fish are incredible, and I have to share some of what we know about them with you. There's a lot more that we don't know than we do know, it seems. It appears they can grow up to 2 meters in length. The average female weighs in at 82 kilograms, or 180 pounds. The males are a bit smaller, averaging about 37 kilograms, or 81-ish pounds. They give birth to live young, they eat cephalopods like cuttlefish, squid, and octopi. They have paired fins that move in a similar fashion to arms and legs. They have a rostral organ in their snout that is part of their electrosensory system, which is probably something they use while hunting for prey. That's freaking cool. They also have an intracranial hinge in their skull that allows their cranium to swing upwards when they open their mouths, kind of like a muppet. This greatly increases the gape of their mouths. It must suck for a cephalopod when that's the last thing it sees. Coelacanths have remained remarkably static in terms of evolution. They haven't changed much over the last few million years, but they have changed a little bit. For example, inside of a fatty organ they have, which acts like a swim bladder, there is a vestigial lung surrounded by hard plates. It's believed these plates aided with lung volume regulation in their ancestral species, but have become a sort of unused, leftover piece of evolution in living species. They prefer to live in caves in the ocean's twilight zone, a layer of water that exists just beyond the reach of sunlight. It's cold and dark, with occasional flashes of light brought on by bioluminescent organisms. It's a strange ecosystem, perfect for hiding something, 
for 66 million years. There is some debate as to exactly where we should place the coelacanth in the evolutionary history of vertebrates. We don't really know how long they can live, and I found differing estimates while researching, with the Encyclopedia Britannica suggesting that they can live up to 100 years. We don't even really know how far their habitat stretches. For years, it was thought that they only lived in the Western Indian Ocean. That was until a doctoral student stumbled upon one in northern Sulawesi, Indonesia, well over 6,000 miles away from Marjorie's find in 1997. That student, now a coral reef ecologist with a PhD, was Mark Erdman. He was on his honeymoon in northern Sulawesi when he spotted a coelacanth at a fish market. Eventually, he was able to photograph a live specimen for the first time ever. He got to discover a new species of coelacanth for science while he was on his honeymoon. That must have been the best week of his life. The Indonesian coelacanth population is different enough from the African one that they have been categorized as a different species. By 1991, a ban had to be imposed on the trade of coelacanths in order to protect them, though the black market still poses a threat to both species, both of which are considered threatened by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. The African coelacanth is classified as critically endangered and the Sulawesi species is classified as vulnerable. Most of us will probably not get the chance to see a live coelacanth swimming around in the Twilight Zone, but there are museums with preserved specimens. If you have a museum anywhere near you that has a coelacanth, it's totally worth the drive. I saw one at the Smithsonian a few years back and totally freaked out. And I remember thinking it was weird that no one else was freaking out. I've been charmed by the story of the coelacanth and the way Marjorie Courtney Latimer went out of her way to preserve it since I first heard about it as an undergrad 5,000 years ago. And whatever happened to Marjorie Courtney Latimer? Well, she kept working. She stayed at the museum, collecting, conserving, and exploring until she retired in 1973. She was awarded an honorary doctorate from Rhodes University for her contributions to science. Even after retirement, her curiosity never seemed to diminish. She wrote a book on wildflowers and never lost her zeal for South Africa's natural environment or anything in it. On May 17, 2004, she passed away at the age of 97. She had a long, full life and pursued the things she loved with a dedication that changed our understanding of the natural world. She never married or had any children. She is survived by two nieces and a nephew. Her legacy is a fish. But more than that, her legacy is the unquenchable curiosity of a sharp mind that dared to follow what made her happy. And that resulted in the resurrection of a living fossil. That is certainly inspiring, and it helps us spark our own curiosity. Because if a fish can hide for 66 million years just out of reach, in a place where even the sunlight can't penetrate, it makes you wonder, what else is down there? Thank you so much for listening to the history of the coelacanth and Marjorie Courtney Latimer. I've been wanting to tell this story for a long time, so this episode was a special one for me. I hope you enjoyed it and that it sparked your curiosity like it did mine. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back again in three weeks with more history for you. In the meantime, if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can email me at historycashpodcast at gmail.com. Sound effects and background music were licensed through Envato Elements, theme songs from Audio Jungle. Stay safe, stay smart, stay curious. And until we meet again, my dear friends, Go make some history.